Hey guys, I'm Versha, and this election day, it is more important than ever to exercise your hard-earned right to vote. America has elected some pretty shady people in the past, but at least we haven't voted in any mad scientist or costumed criminals yet. Lex Luthor's attempt to win the presidency the old-fashioned way by buying it seems to be picking up steam. When it comes to comic books, though, supervillains have infiltrated some of our highest offices and made life hell for citizens of the Marvel and DC universes. These are just a few examples of what happens when supervillains get votes. Wait a second, you're making me talk about supervillains wearing this? Let's start in Metropolis, where one of the very first supervillains launched his bid for office, Lex Luthor. Depending on how you feel about the Big Blue Boy Scout, Alexander Luther is either a benevolent genius fighting off an alien invader that's holding humanity back, or a madman who wants to exterminate Earth's greatest protector simply because he wasn't born here. That sounds kind of familiar. You can't build a wall to keep Superman away from his adopted home, though. But on more than one occasion, we the people have elected Lex Luthor to save us from the so-called Kryptonian menace. There's alternate universes like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Strikes Again, where Luthor is the puppet master pulling the strings of a phony holographic president, and Mark Millar's Red Sun, where he actually becomes a pretty decent guy once the Soviet Superman is out of the picture, and he can focus his genius on leading mankind to new heights of peace and prosperity. The Justice League cartoon has another great Elseworlds example in the episode A Better World which begins with Superman busting down the door of the Oval Office to arrest President Luther, with his finger literally on the nuclear launch button. There are at least six different ways I can stop you right now. But they all involve deadly force, don't they? And you don't do that. Luther's taunts get the better of the Man of Steel, though, and his term is cut short by a blast of heat vision. It's really intense. As far as canonical campaigns go, the real Lex Luthor was elected president shortly after the new millennium. After an earthquake turned Gotham City into a no man's land, Luthor poured millions of his ill-gotten gains into reconstruction, and he rode that great PR to a landslide election victory. As president, Luther then banned fossil fuels, promised Americans a flying car in every garage, and used his power to frame his enemies and demonize Superman at pretty much every opportunity. No one is above the law. I learned that for myself many years ago. I have already taken steps to bring some of these superhumans into the service of our government. As always, the mad scientist underestimated the public's love for the last son of Krypton. And instead of tweeting his displeasure at 4 a.m., you know, like a normal president, Luther pumped himself full of super steroids and took to the sky in an alien battle suit to handle his haters personally. Luther's tenure only lasted three years, but it had lasting effects on the DC universe. And as for Marvel, well, they've had their fair share of supervillains who conquered the Electoral College. The trickster god Loki ran a fairly successful campaign in 2016, although he did come up short once the votes came in. But if you're looking for real leadership and you hate Reed Richards with every fiber of your being, you might want to get behind Dr. Doom. Now, normally, Victor Von Doom has no need for the likes of democracy and elections because he's already the tyrannical dictator of Latveria, a tiny European country that he rules with an iron fist. But Doom's ambition doesn't stop there. In the alternate future of 2099, Doom invades the United States and declares himself the new president. And the irony is, he's actually much better for the country than the brain trust of corrupt CEOs and megacorps that have previously been pulling the strings. It's similar to the famous graphic novel Emperor Doom, where he uses the Purple Man's persuasive powers to convince the world's governments to hand him control of the planet. I now possess the power to end hunger to abolish disease, to eliminate crime, to establish a perfectly content, perfectly ordered world, all under the benevolence of my iron will. And honestly, Earth under Doom's rule isn't the worst place to live. He ends apartheid in South Africa, 
puts a stop to hunger and famine, and dismantles all the world's armies. It gives the Avengers a real conundrum once they snap out of their mind control, because Doom genuinely made the world a better place, but at the cost of humanity's freedom and free will. Those things are kind of important. Luckily, Doom doesn't try too hard to stop the counterattack because he's become so bored with the bureaucracy and red tape of actually running the world. He basically lets the Avengers win so he can have fun trying to conquer it again. Now, before we get to Marvel's most infamous Commander-in-Chief, we should talk about a couple of villains who landed in some of the lower cabinet positions. They weren't elected to the highest office, but they still did plenty of damage to our nation as appointed antagonists. Even though his murderous actions as the Green Goblin were public knowledge, Norman Osborn was able to rehabilitate his image thanks to the secret invasion of the Skrulls. As a result of some behind-the-scenes scheming, the insane industrialist personally ended the conflict by blowing the Skrull Queen's brains out on national television. Then, he used the resulting goodwill to get himself placed in charge of Hammer, the government's more hardcore replacement for S.H.I.E.L.D., after it was infested by Skrull sleeper agents. This led to a massive storyline called Dark Reign, where Osborn basically uses the entire military-industrial complex as his own twisted toy, creating a cabal of the world's most diabolical supervillains and forming a team of bloodthirsty Dark Avengers, with himself in the lead as the Iron Patriot. Citizens were surprisingly down with letting a madman in a Halloween costume run national security, ignoring his past crimes in the futile pursuit of safety. But Osborn took things too far when he organized a military invasion of Asgard under false pretenses. At least his downfall brought the end of the Superhero Registration Act. But there was no upside when the Red Skull conned his way into the cabinet. In a 2003 issue of The Avengers, a senator named Del Rusk became the Secretary of Defense in Marvel's America, at which point he proceeded to release a deadly bioweapon from a secret lab behind Mount Rushmore. In case the crimson mist didn't clue you in, try rearranging the letters in Del Rusk. Red Skull. That's right, Captain America's deadliest foe managed to infiltrate the highest echelon of our military. But once his oh-so-clever anagram ruse was exposed, the skull was met with swift justice when Black Panther literally punched him so hard, his jawbone broke in half. Now, all of these examples are thankfully still pretty far-fetched, but how do comics respond when the buck stops with a real-life bad guy? We're gonna close out with a look at the time Captain America duped it out with Richard Nixon. America was facing a crisis of conscience in the 70s. The Vietnam War was a messy moral quagmire, and our commander-in-chief turned out to be a crook. It was a tough time for star-spangled superheroes. So in 1973, writer Steve Englehart decided to address the great malaise in the pages of Captain America. The so-called Secret Empire, which is not to be confused with the recent controversial crossover, was a shadowy supervillain organization hell-bent on seizing power and soiling Cap's good name. What? What did you say? And their leader, number one, was heavily implied to be none other than Tricky Dick himself. Time for Dicky to get tricky! Cap chases him into the Oval Office, and just before the supervillain takes his own life, he rants about how being elected president didn't satisfy him, and that his power was too constrained by all those pesky legalities. We never see the leader's face, but Engelhart has confirmed that the story was his way of addressing the Watergate scandal, and that number one was Marvel's equivalent of Richard Milhouse Nixon. I saw him, I heard him, I touched him, he was real. Granted, landing a flying saucer on the White House lawn and threatening to nuke every American city is a lot less nuanced than breaking into your political opponent's hotel room. The real Nixon wasn't a costume supervillain or a mad scientist bent on world domination. He was just a mortal man who abused his power and took advantage of the American people's faith and trust. Real life is a lot messier than the four-color world of comic books, and the consequences of elections have never been more crucial. One person's villain is another person's hero, 
And the only way you can make your voice heard and fight for the values and leaders that you believe in is to get out there and vote. Have a voice in your future. Register and vote. <laughs> and Tom Spider-Man sent you. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you have any questions about the voting process or you want to find your polling place, just go to vote.org for all the necessary information. Please subscribe to Now This Nerd, and above all else, don't forget to vote.